the formidable robots. The summer of 2004 is one I would never forget for the rest of my life. I used to be a keyframe animator who worked on a good handful of Nickelodeon programs. My job was to add extra revisions and touch-ups to the keyframes of the animation. Due to the job not exactly being a super important one, I had the option to have a lot of my work uncredited, and 9 times out of 10, unless it was a much smaller project, I would always leave myself without my name in the credits of the project. I really don't like that much attention and so this decision was one that many other animators and workers at the company felt was controversial, but it was something that personally appealed to my best wishes. I started working at Nickelodeon in 1997, I graduated with my degree in character design and animation in arts college, and immediately was hired by Nickelodeon due to their animation studios being only about a 30 minute drive from where I lived at the time. It was good pay, decent work experience, and it had a lot of perks outside of working directly with the, at the time, biggest and most popular children's TV show network in the United States. One thing was that I was able to catch the episodes I worked on early, as we would always be handed a rough animatic composed of our work and storyboards, which we used to review and make sure that the higher-ups didn't want any last-minute changes before it would be transferred into the final animation stages, which is where me and my co-workers would come in. Then it would be sent out to the final editing room where many post-animation changes would be made, and then the episode would be shipped out to air officially on the TV stations. When I was a touch-up animator at Nickelodeon, I started by doing small touch-ups to shows like Hey Arnold and the Angry Beavers before 1999, where I began to work under Steven Hillenburg, the creator of SpongeBob SquarePants. Before Spongebob was seen as this huge cultural milestone, it was initially considered just another cartoon in the rounds of cartoons that would be pitched, with it being one of the lucky ones to be fully greenlit, making it past the pitch pilot stage. I was there when Spongebob was pitched in 1998, originally under the name Spongeboy Ahoy, I saw Steven firsthand with various props and a ukulele telling the animators and writers who worked on shows like Rocco's Modern Life and Cat Dog that this will be the next big show for the network, and one that would knock execs socks off. When the show was fully greenlit, there was mass speculation amongst the different teams wondering if the show would ever make it past one season, let alone get to the level it would. We were all proven wrong with how much SpongeBob was a success for the network. Ratings numbers were in the millions for episode premieres, merch being made was flying off the shelves, hell, mainstream news outlets that would rarely ever cover cartoons unless you were a household name like Mickey Mouse or The Simpsons would cover the yellow sponge and his nautical nonsense. In 2000, during the creation of the second season, Hillenburg personally tasked me to be the head touch-up animator on Spongebob from then on, and swiftly I got to work on the show, albeit with my name still uncredited. During that time period, I made a lot of friends in the studio, one of them being a person named Michael Shelley, someone who also had a passion for animation and would work with me daily with animation touch-ups. We were so joined at the hip that some animators started making an inside joke around the office that Michael was secretly my brother, and I played along by constantly calling him bro while on the clock, it even got to the point where Steven Hillenburg was in on the joke and called him my brother as well. From 2000 to 2003, things would be extremely smooth sailing for Nickelodeon, as well as the relationship I had with Michael. However, things would shift in late 2003, and I can clearly remember the atmosphere when this shift began, as I was both blessed and cursed with a photographic memory. During that time, there were a lot of production shifts internally as there were a lot of new more experienced animation workers who hopped onto the development of the Spongebob movie, this led to Michael being promoted up to being a primary storyboard artist. Originally I was very happy for Michael, and was ecstatic to see him working more directly with the writers and the producers on making what would be the biggest production in the company's history, however the reality started to dawn on me that Michael wasn't doing okay after the release of the movie officially. To give some context, after the release of the movie, Steven Hillenburg resigned from his job as director and showrunner of Spongebob. 
in a massive meeting with Nickelodeon high-ups and various showrunners, one that was public knowledge from the get-go if you were in the industry. Hillenburg expressed frustrations with how the higher-ups at Nick wanted to make the show their next cash cow, after Arlene Klasky and Gaber Chupo left due to wanting to move away from their previous cash cow rugrats, and move on from Nick sometime in 2002. The Klasky Chupo studio still produced Rugrats-related properties and spin-offs way after, but the main owners of the studio had nothing to do with the projects. It felt like history was about to repeat itself in this meeting, as Hillenburg told the higher-ups that he feared that SpongeBob merch was going to wash up on the shores as landfill, which is the antithesis of what he originally created the show for, but the Nick execs did not feel bad for him or his worries whatsoever. From the word of mouth I was able to get from my previous co-workers, Stephen left the meeting notably upset and the next day, would send an email to everyone who worked on the show letting them know that he would be resigning from his position and leaving Nickelodeon as a whole. This came across as a massive shock to everyone, including myself and Michael, in which we both talked over the phone about it after work ended. Overnight, Steven Hillenberg would be replaced by Paul Tibbet, and while I have no disrespect to Paul, it was clear that things felt pretty off when he came in to oversee production compared to Steven. Steven would come visit the offices once or twice a week to check up on all of us, relay some information from the corporate office, and then tell us we were doing a good job. Whereas with Tibbet, he only came in once for 30 minutes and just relayed information to us. You see, while I didn't know Steven very closely, he always had a very optimistic and lively personality to him, and was okay with some errors or problems slipping through the cracks, whereas Paul was a perfectionist, and needed the episodes to be done in a specific way and all the errors and blemishes to the animation completely fixed, which meant extra work for myself and others in my area. When Paul Tibbet was named the next showrunner, he let everyone who worked on the show know that the higher-ups demanded that the episode count for SpongeBob increased, thus leading to more work for all of us, which meant the hours at work were ten times more stressful. I tried to keep composure during this time, but with Michael, it was a completely different story. After work days, I would get calls from Michael where he would tell me the workload was too much for him and it's causing him to miss talking with his family and flaring up his depression, and I would always tell him to get back to the ground so he didn't do anything stupid. However, one day would change my life and the course of the workers at the studio for good. For context, the day before that, Michael called me and told me that he was in a good mood, because he was tasked to work on the official first episode of season 4. He told me the episode was going to be about Squidward finally succeeding in clarinet playing and getting a big concert at the end of the episode, and he even had the name for it. He called it, Concert of a Squid, and told me that the animatics should be ready tomorrow. Initially I didn't think much of it, in fact, I was really happy that he was in such a big role whereas I'm still stuck doing touch-ups, however in hindsight, I should have seen the warning signs. Now before I continue on explaining what happened, I want to clear up some misconceptions Spongebob fans have made before. There is a lot of speculation about two aspects, the first is why it took so long for season 4 to start after the movie, and the second is the deal with the missing episode with the production code, 5572-220. Well to tell you all the truth, the missing episode with that production code, was Concert of a Squid. That episode was intended to be the first of season 4, with fear of a Krabby Patty being the accompanying sister episode, however after the incident I'm about to tell you, not only would the production and airing of season 4 be halted, but Concert of a Squid would be completely skipped over, with fear of a Krabby Patty taking its place and another episode was made in a rush to be its sister episode. Many are asking, why did this happen? Well I was able to recall not just the episode but the aftermath of what happened, and how it changed the course of my life forever. I vividly remember the day and it still lingers in my mind like a bad fever dream. The day started normally, with all of us doing our work and having a good time. At around 1 p.m., 30 minutes after lunch break, my co-worker Julie came up to me and let me know that the first season for animatic made it to the studio, and we were going to watch over it in a couple of minutes. 
I left my station, taking my noon coffee with me, and we all arrived at the meeting room, where a good chunk of the animators were having a casual conversation while we waited for someone to arrive with the animatic. After a few minutes of awkward small talk, one of my other co-workers who I forgot the name of, arrived with one of those 2D stands on wheels which are commonly seen in public schools, especially during this time period. The co-worker put a blank VHS tape in the VCR, and the episode began for us. The title card said, Red Mist, and this got a chuckle out of me and some of the others in the room, the reason why is because it was an inside joke between the people that worked there. You see, the title card is usually made in post-production, and so the workers will interject their own joke title cards, usually consisting of pop culture references or inside jokes that float around the offices. The Red Mist joke was from one of the animators at lunch break drinking code Red Mountain Dew and doing a spit take after another one of them told a joke, they spit out the drink and many of us coined the term Red Mist, due to the spit take looking like, well, Red Mist. Then the episode officially began. Since I still remember the content of the episode, I'll give a recap on what happened. It forever loops in my brain. I can never get it out of my brain, no matter how hard I try. This was a rough animatic, so it meant it was mostly storyboards with temp voices and music. Thank god this never got fully animated, because I don't know how I would deal with the guilt if it became a final episode, but with that said, here's how the episode went. The episode began with Squidward playing his clarinet, mostly with sour notes as usual. Squidward would get interrupted by Spongebob and Patrick playing a game in front of Squidward's yard. Spongebob and Patrick's laughter started to irritate Squidward and screwed up his clarinet playing, even more so than usual. Squidward would get annoyed, open his window and tell both of the nautical neighbors to keep things down, due to Squidward practicing for a concert he got invited to. SpongeBob asked how he got invited, to which Squidward would reply that the Bikini Bottom Theater has an open mic night, and that it was his chance to get his big break. SpongeBob and Patrick would send positive advice to Squidward, telling him good luck, before they decided to head to Jellyfish Fields, to do what else, but go jellyfishing. Squidward would continue to play his clarinet in the usual way he does. We get a montage of Squidward practicing, the hours would pass by as Squidward continued to improve, getting into shenanigans in his home as he attempted to get better and better, and by the end of the montage, it was sunset, with Squidward hitting that perfect note, confident enough he's going to blow the citizens of Bikini Bottom away. A bubble transition leads us into nighttime, with Squidward being next in line for open mic night. Squidward would confidently give a speech about how he worked for hours on perfecting his craft, and he hoped that the crowd would enjoy it. Squidward then played his clarinet. The notes were a mix of really good and sour, however mid-performance, the people in attendance started to boo and jeer Squidward. Squidward, not paying attention, still played his clarinet until he finished the song. Even after the song was done, Squidward still thought he was doing the performance of his life. It took a minute before Squidward realized that the crowd didn't like it. The crowd would cartoonishly continue to boo him, with the security guards of the building throwing him out to top it all off. Squidward was notably angry and told the crowd that they didn't respect true talent. SpongeBob and Patrick would leave the building, with SpongeBob saying that he loved Squidward's performance. Squidward gave both of them the cold shoulder and walked off, as SpongeBob and Patrick looked on, worried about their friend. We see Squidward looking for Lorne, walking home, looking very sad. During this period, the art got more scribbly and rough. One of my co-workers nudged me during this and pointed that out, saying that he didn't expect the storyboard artists to do such a rush job. The sequence of the sad cephal upon walking home felt like it was hours, but it was only about half a minute or so. Squidward finally arrives at home, depressingly walks upstairs, sits on the corner of his bed, and proceeds to speak. Squidward would say this. I failed. I failed as a person. All I wanted to do was work hard. Give it my all. Prove to everyone I could make it somewhere in life. I guess that was asking for too much. That concert was my last chance. And yet I can never amount to anything. This is my life. This is my sad pathetic life. All that's going to matter to the people is that I fell flat on my face trying to be something. I'm at the end of the road. 
I don't know if I will ever recover. I guess that's my cue to leave this world. This dialogue came from someone who was doing a forced version of Roger Bumpus' Squidward voice, but it sounded very distraught. I immediately knew from the first word who it was doing the voice, it was Michael. Most of the co-workers after hearing this started to get confused and concerned. Someone in the back of the room tried to say it was temp dialogue in some way to comprehend what was said. As for me, my heart sank to my stomach. This wasn't just Michael reading off of a script, this was something that truly came from his soul. Weeks of phone calls and worrying depressive spells all started to circle in my mind, one of my co-workers tried to ask if I was doing okay, and I lied to them, saying that I'm doing just fine. However, that wasn't all of it. To get back to the episode, Squidward continued to look for Lorne, and then he put his tentacles over his eyes, and began to cry. This crying fit was agonizing, and while it did sound like fake crying, it got progressively harder and harder, and then around the middle mark of this scene, the crying became real. Very real. I was in fight or flight mode, wanting to jump out of my chair and call Michael as soon as I fucking could, but I was too in shock to even move. Many of us did start to feel very worried and upset, with a couple thinking it was great acting, a part of me wanted to violently correct them but I didn't want to risk my job, so I stayed put. During this crying, the storyboards became incomprehensible scribbles, nothing even resembled Squidward or what was going on in the scene anymore, despite that in the scribbles, and in the blubbering crying mess, I heard Michael say something through it all. I let everyone down. My family, my job, my best friend, who was like a brother to me. I let Steven down, I let my co-workers down, I couldn't fucking handle the job anymore. If you're seeing this, I'm sorry. I'm no longer here. Just take care of yourselves. Goodbye. I love you all. The tape then ejected itself. After that, all of us were left stunned, shocked, surprised, and I was on the verge of tears. It felt like forever before anyone said a single word, but the first thing I heard was one of my co-workers telling me to check on Michael. I sprinted out of the room, hesitantly grabbed my cell phone, and tried to call Michael, each time it was left at a message. I called that same exact number 30 fucking times over the course of 15 frantic minutes and not a single time did I get an answer. I overheard so many different conversations coming from the meeting room, many were scared and upset, and some tried to say it was a sick prank courtesy of the storyboard artists, but I knew for a goddamn fact that this was a suicide note. I immediately left the studio and immediately called the police, telling them about the note and how it took the form of an animatic at our studio. It took a half hour for the police to get there, and they immediately tried to de-escalate the tension and worry across the whole studio, as this led to other offices from other shows, along with other departments, to worry and wonder what just happened. One of the managers of the building told us all to head home early while the police investigated what was going on. When I got home, I didn't do a single thing. I couldn't. I was too worried about one of my closest friends. I tried to tell myself that this was all a nightmare that I will eventually wake up from, but it wasn't, it was the harsh reality that I was living in. The next couple of days felt extremely off. No one was able to talk about what happened. The higher-ups put an embargo on discussion of the situation until we get a result of the investigation, telling us to continue business as usual. The local police department took in the tape as evidence into the case, letting us all know the day after that they are working hard to find Michael safely, if he was still alive. I could barely get any work done. I couldn't think of anything else aside from that godforsaken animatic. No one else really spoke either. We were all uncharacteristically quiet, none of the cheerful banter, none of the inside jokes, we were all quiet, and we had to be unless we risked losing our jobs. If you're all wondering why I don't work for Nickelodeon anymore, or any other major corporation for that matter, it's because of this situation. The corporate offices were so uncaring and negligent of what happened, that they wanted to keep the money coming in despite such a drastic emergency situation taking place. It's sickening, and it's just the consequence of modern capitalism. A week had passed, and that day, I would get the closure I needed. While I was doing my work for that day, Paul Tibbet and a police officer came to my desk, and told me to come with them. 
I reluctantly followed them into an empty meeting room, closing the door behind us. I sat down, as the silence haunted me. Tibbet and the officer looked at me, with the officer giving me the hard truth. The officer told me that they found Michael, however they didn't find him alive. Their search officers found his body in the shotgun seat of his car. An autopsy was performed and they found that he had taken his own life by overdosing on prescription pills, 20 minutes away from the studio in the middle of a dead-end road. The officer went into excruciating detail about his mental condition, telling me that he sends his condolences to me and his family. Tibbet then talked to me and told me that the reason why he's here is because he worked directly with Michael, and that Michael the day before he took his life, was excited to work on the episode he did, and so Tibbet gave him full control to create a storyboard animatic. He looked very upset and regretful, telling me that if he saw the warning signs beforehand that he would have gotten him the help he needed, and told me that I did all I could do. I was there for Michael at his highest and lowest points, and, God, I wish I was able to save him. We were separated when he was promoted to a storyboard artist, and if I was there that night, I would have prevented him from dying, he still would have been with us. Even 20 years later, I still live with the guilt. Tibbet was able to convince the higher-ups to allow me to take a two-month-long vacation with pay, so I can clear my mind and grieve. During that two-month period, I went to Michael's funeral, I constantly visited Michael's mother, wife and siblings to comfort them, and I even wrote a letter to Steven Hillenburg, now long gone from Nickelodeon, about what happened to Michael. Unfortunately, I never got a letter back from him. Now that Hillenburg is no longer with us either, I don't think I will ever know if he got the letter. I left Nickelodeon officially in 2008. Originally I wanted to keep working there to keep the legacy of Michael going, continuing to work there as a means to pay tribute. This all changed in early 2008, when higher ups came up to me and advised me to sign an NDA about what happened to Michael. As it turns out, Nick would damage control the situation and take zero responsibility for the incident, and told me that they would pay me $3 million if I never told anyone what happened. I declined, and immediately resigned from my position in the company afterwards. This abrupt departure also led to me being completely blacklisted from the animation industry, as word got around fast to other animation studios. I still have a significant passion for animation, so much that I have a hand helping out independent projects, but the ship of me working for major companies has long sailed. Honestly, I don't think I will ever go back. After the mistreatment and lack of care Michael got that lead to his unfortunate passing, and how they showed zero remorse for him afterwards, I made a vow not to ever work for the industry again. To conclude this open letter, I want to pay tribute. Michael Allen Shelley, he had a whole life ahead of him, he could have done great things, his work could have touched and inspired so many people. I will miss him every single day. I hope you're looking down on me smiling. You didn't let anyone down, you didn't fail anyone, we failed you. Love you brother.